three, two, one. Welcome to the David the Dog Trainer Podcast, episode eighty-three. Here with Josh. Hello, Josh. How are you? I'm doing quite well, actually. Uh, besides a terrible rainstorm outside, it's real gloomy out. It's real gloomy. It's. I mean, I see the rain just downpouring out there. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday was so hot and beautiful out. Yeah. And today is just crap. Yeah. Like he said, it just makes you want to not do anything makes today. You want to just like sit in and watch movies all day. I'm surprised we even made it up here. It's funny. I think, <laughs> um, I don't think it was last time. I think it was the episode before. Yeah. When we were talking about like music and like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And somebody commented on it <clears throat> and said, um, what did they say? He's like, yeah, I, a part of me wants to like pay your consultation fee and just talk about like music like the whole time or something <laughs> like that. He's like, you talking about being an introvert and just wanting to like listen to music and like watch movies and stuff like that. He's like, I really resonated with that. <laughs> Hell yeah. See, we're, we're a flavor for everyone. We are, you know, it's very normal. <laughs> so it's been a wild week. Actually, it's, it has not been a wild week. It's been a pretty good week, you yeah. know. So obviously, the last podcast we did, we talked about all the uh, uh, TikTok drama. That's pretty much subsided at this point, aside from a straggler here and there. I actually just saw uh, two seconds ago some other freaking whatever page with like a hundred thousand followers just made another one of those little uh, stitches or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. But for the most part, we've had a good week. We have. Uh, we've been. We've been still putting out a lot of content, and we've been able to create some really awesome pieces. We've had some really awesome breakthroughs with dogs that we've posted uh, over the last uh, last handful of days, and had some really great engagement on our channels. Um, so that's been cool. Obviously, I've really so. I would say earlier this year and last year, I kind of took a back seat on like engaging personally on like the Miracle Channel. Like mm. I think a lot, like the staff was doing a lot of the stuff on there. Uh, and I've really been like kind of heading that again lately. <clears throat> so like obviously yep. all your replies and stuff you guys get from there uh, are from me. So uh, yeah. I've been having a lot of fun just kind of talking with everybody and like answering questions and things like that. So um, keep hopping on there. Keep commenting on the videos. Keep asking questions about them. I'll try to get as detailed as I can with the responses to you guys. We'll use some of those things as like content for on the podcast and all that kind of stuff. But we've had a pretty, pretty solid week here so far. So um, getting back into the swing of things with, um, like I said, posting some new stuff up for you guys and everything. So yeah. Super exciting. Josh, what's been new? Anything? <laughs> um, just getting into the <laughs> real estate business. You know, uh, I had my first shoot with this uh, this company here locally in Cleveland. Uh, shot a nice little penthouse, some outside photos. Uh, it's the start of a pretty big project for me that I talked about last week. But um, it's uh, it's been fun to be doing something out of my wheelhouse, you know. You know, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much a food product photographer at this point, and I haven't done real estate in about six years. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of fun to to sit in that seat again. Um, we're also my my friend; he does drone work. Um, he's doing the uh, video portion of this project, and uh, it's been really fun to kind of like learn from him because that's what he's been doing for the last three or four years. So it was kind of a nice eye opening effect, I guess. You know, when you kind of go out of your wheelhouse and, and you get to learn again from other people mm -hmm. instead of like everyone going, Oh, you're so good. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, Oh, you could do this better and you could do this better. And, and that, that was really fun. It was a nice little growth experiment. And I th think, you know, cause I have multiple shoots with this coming in the future. Yeah. That is actually going to probably help me grow uh, more so as a photographer. So it's been mm -hmm. fun. Continuing to flex those photography yeah. muscles. You yeah. Know? Yes. So. Very cool. Um, awesome. So uh, a couple things today. So thing number one here. So we've been asked a handful of times about ding, 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 ding. Hey. This new Halo e-collar by Caesar Milan. So this yeah. is his newest product that he came out with. So it's an e-collar. It is. Let's see what it says here. It's a virtual fence collar, a GPS tracker, an activity tracker, and a training collar, meaning it's an e-collar, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> right. Whoa. Um, so um, we, we've been asked a couple of times about, like, reviewing it, what we think of it. I have not used it so far, right? So I just got wow. this thing in the mail the other day. Um, I'm planning on taking a week or two and using this thing, like, exclusively with Vinny um, okay. so that I can give you guys a solid read off of what I think of it. Um 
you know, there's been a lot of different like novelty type e-collars that have come out over the course of the last couple of years. The last one that yeah. I could remember that was <clears throat> similar ish to this one, but uh, not completely the same. It was pretty hyped up and I thought it was going to be pretty cool. Wound up being kind of a flop. It was, um, I think it was Garmin's uh, newest e-collar that they came out with and it was same deal. So like this one, it's ran off your phone, right? So Garmin's e collar was similar. It didn't have a remote, right? The couple mm. things I thought I was going to like about the Garmin e collar was it had one, like, hot spot tags that you can get, right? Um, so it had, like, these little chips that you could stick on miscellaneous things throughout your house. So whether it's your trash can, stick one under the Christmas tree, stick one, whatever. You know, mm. wherever you want to keep the dog away from, obviously, and it'll create kind of perimeters around it. Um, and I think in concept, it was a good idea. I think the fact that it didn't have a remote, the unit itself felt very cheap. So it actually had plastic contact points on it, which is kind of an interesting thing. I don't really know the science behind it, how it works as far as creating yeah. conductivity and stuff like That's that. Weird. But it, it just kind of felt like chintzy like that. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it was kind of at a, like a higher price point and stuff like that. So I didn't yeah. like it as much. So first impressions on this one, like just like pulling it out of the box and looking at it and stuff thing feels like it's made very well, right? So the collar itself seems pretty legit, obviously. Uh, it still does not have a remote, right? So when you get into yeah. utilizing this thing as an actual e-collar, I think, you know, in, the, in the, the scheme of like me using it for my dogs where I don't need to actually use the e-collar that often, it's not that big of a deal, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, but if I were to try to train a dog using this thing, mm -hmm. right. And like, you know, go through the repetitions and, you know, using the continuous pressure feature on it mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, uh, this would be, in my opinion, probably very complicated to use. I think this is being primarily marketed right now as the, uh, virtual fence collar and like the GPS tracker more than anything. Cause this came out around the same time as like those, uh, um, um, with that, those fies or whatever started becoming mm. super popular. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, basically, yeah. if your dog runs off on you, you could track them wherever the hell yeah. they're at, which I think is pretty sweet. That's yeah, cool. And I think that most uh, e-collars, if they had that as a built-in feature to them, I think that would be fantastic because you get yeah. into, like, off-leash training and stuff like that. I mean, there's nothing guaranteeing your dog is going to take off. Obviously, good training and preparation and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, in a perfect world, we would say it would never happen. But, like, it... it <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. like shit happens, right? It it's really not, does. It's not like it, it couldn't ever happen. So having that on it is um, something that could obviously really save your ass. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the invisible fence feature, I'm really excited to play around with. And mm -hmm. I'm really curious how well it's going to work from the standpoint of you could create your own perimeters with it right so yeah. it's not like most invisible fence collars that you'll see out there that create one standardized perimeter and it stays there and that's it yeah. um, you could customize this thing completely from your phone and set what that perimeter is going to be right so if you go to a campground and you want to put out your plot of land right that you have mm. for your campground it'll create that radius for that if you want to do it with your backyard, it'll create that radius for that. If you want to just go hang out at the dog beach with your dog and keep them within a certain radius, yeah. you could set it to that, you know, realistically. So I think that this collar, how I imagine it being used primarily is mm -hmm. going to be um, in that type of setting, right? So yeah. a dog that is already trained, a dog that mm -hmm. has done all of the e-collar training stuff on a different type of e-collar, yeah. and you want something that's going to be a reliable thing mm -hmm. that you could utilize with them mm -hmm. in that type of context, I think it can be super beneficial. Here's the downside to it. Price point, this motherfucker is expensive, man. How much? Right? So since it just came out, this is like the new model of it, they were running like a, a discount on it, but it was still $650, what? Yeah, right? So this Holy thing, shit. I paid $650 for this thing. Now, listen, right? I want to uh, test it out. I'm yeah. excited to test it out, stuff like that. Without that discount, if they ever... And it could just be... Could be like this marketing thing they do where mm -hmm. they're like, oh, it's usually this much, but you get it for this much. And they might always sell it for that lower amount. Yeah. But if it wasn't, this thing is marked at $1,000, right? So if you want to go out and buy this thing without that discount, it's going to cost you a grand. Wow. Right? That's so insane. that's a serious downfall, right? So like yeah. I, if I wasn't testing this thing out, right, I am perfectly confident in my e-collar handling skills, yeah. I'm perfectly confident in being able to set those perimeters mm -hmm. with my own e-collar, right, for mm -hmm. my dogs. 
Um, I don't think I would need this thing necessarily, right? Yeah. Now, for again, for your average owner whose timing isn't super great with everything, mm -hmm. and maybe you get a little distracted when you're out and about with your dog and stuff like that, this could be a total game changer for you and being yeah. able to like take your dog to more places and have them enjoy a little bit more freedom obviously right yeah the other thing i'm curious about and i haven't really looked into it a whole lot yet is how that invisible fence works from the standpoint of is there like a tone function where like yeah. it teaches the dog when you start feeling this tone turn the opposite direction or yeah. does it just start stimming right away when they hit that perimeter how does the dog understand what the perimeter is because mm -hmm. you figure if you're changing the perimeter all the time on them that starts to become a little bit potentially unfair as yeah. far as them needing to adjust all the time to what that expectation is right yeah. um now you get into <laughs> Is that really that big of a deal? Not really, obviously. But again, I've always talked about creating perimeters with dogs. Like so, so I do a lot of off leash hiking with my dogs, right? Mm -hmm. And I, because we're constantly moving, this wouldn't serve a purpose of that because I can't set a radius from me. I could just set a radius to like a geographical location, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I kind of do the same concept as far as teaching my dog a perimeter I want them to stay within. So mm -hmm. let's say I'm on a trail and they're off leash, right? It's not that I'm telling them, oh, 30 yards up is where you're, you can't go any further or something yeah. like that. I have a mental picture of roughly how far mm -hmm. I'm going to allow my dogs to get away from me. And when they hit that point, I'm just going to practice a recall every time they hit that point. Mm -hmm. And through patterning that in, what will happen is as the dog starts getting X distance away, it's not that they're looking and seeing like, oh, I'm 30 yards away. I can't go any further. But they start thinking maybe I should check in with dad because he usually calls me you know, every so-and-so, right? And then obviously if they don't come at that point, yeah. I correct them. And that's what really enforces that perimeter and mm -hmm. keeps them within the realms of that bubble, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I work through some of those types of things yeah. personally with my dogs, you know, same concept, you know, like with, with my own e-collar, right? You know, without the need of these types of perimeters and stuff, I could set those same boundaries and stuff as well. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Like I said, I'm probably going to start using this thing today or tomorrow and see what you get. The only thing I really don't like about it is I wish it had some sort of remote on it, right? Yeah. If it were like, I used to talk about the e-collar tech, right? <clears throat> I love the e-collar tech collars, obviously, right? That's what we use with uh, our dogs. That's what I've been using forever. Pretty much since I've been doing yeah. e-collar training, I've been with e-collar technologies, yep. using their mini educator or using their boss collar mm -hmm. pretty exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a stint like halfway, maybe like five years ago or something like that, where e-collar tech was like having some issues with their collars and like having like malfunctions and stuff like that. And they, they didn't feel as reliable. And I was considering switching to Dogtra. I bought one of every single Dogtra collar that was on the market and I tried all of them and I just didn't like them as much. Yeah. I think the e-collar tech is just so much more user friendly. I think it feels better in the hand. I think that even when you get into like marketing and branding and stuff, as much as that doesn't <clears throat> really matter, I think that the dog trick collars were like on the branding. It's like police canine and this yeah. and that. And like, yeah. it looks a little intimidating to your average owner. When oh, you yeah. look at like something like this, the halo collar, yeah. right? Look at this happy little Corgi <laughs> that has it on. And Caesar looks like he's just, he's Smiling. just out there helping. And the branding yeah. is so light and nice. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, there is something to that when you get a tool that has a stigma to it. It's like, yeah. this is a quote unquote shock collar. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That's what this is, right? Yeah. And e collar technologies collars, right? Their branding is all like nice. And they got the dog mm -hmm. with the glasses on and like, what's your IQ? Yeah. You know, like, is your dog <laughs> educated? You know what yeah. I mean? And it's all like kind of like fun and this and that. But again, yeah. it is a shock collar. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, all what it is, whatever, mm -hmm. you know? And the branding is really important for people feeling like they look at that package and they can kind of chuckle when they look at it. Yeah. And like it, it doesn't feel as intimidating. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So those things are, I think, pretty important as well. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The, the first, my first problem is, like you said, a remote. Like, I mean, every app that I've ever had is just like hit or miss sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. And when it, it's really important. I feel like I would rather have a remote than have an app where it's like, is there a delay too? You know, because a lot of 
apps have delays. I feel other like. things I'm going to be curious about. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, again, I wish there was an option to have both. So the e collar tech collars, I used to say, like if there was an option to be able to utilize it from your phone as well, you yeah. know, I think that would be really cool. Yeah, but give us the option yeah, for sure. But give me the option, you yeah. know, or even like uh, like so the e collar tech collars. A, a new popular thing in dog training is the finger kicks, right? Mm. So like. Um, Bart Ballone has this e-collar system called the Martin system, which is like supposed to be like the most high tech e-collar on the market. Mm. And they're made out in like Belgium or wherever the hell he's from. And they got all sort of sorts of like advantages, advantages to them from a mm. training standpoint. They're really uh, discreet. And the reason why he invented this collar in the first place is because I believe in Belgium where they're from. Uh, or whatever country it is that he's from specifically, e collars are actually outlawed, I'm pretty sure. So it oh, yeah, has a right. function on it where, you know, you could use it as like a stem collar, obviously. And then uh, it looks discreet, so it doesn't look like an e collar. And mm -hmm. then it has a feature on it. It's like a kill switch that you hit it and it turns the e collar into a vibrate only collar. So it literally will not stim mm -hmm. you know what i mean and yeah. the only way to reset it is to like basically plug it back into your computer and like reset the program on yeah. it so you can't get like fined or something like that if people are like what's that collar you yeah. take it off it's like it doesn't stim <laughs> you yeah know what i mean so but again same deal it's another crazy expensive collar i think it's like 1200 bucks if you buy one mm. but he invented the finger kick right so like in competitive sports and stuff you're juggling so many different things you got a leash sometimes you got treats you got a toy you got your e-collar you got you know, a whistle, you got, you got like 9,000 different things you have to worry about at any given time. So you created a finger kick that just like puts on your finger. It's like this big. So you can keep your remote in your pocket, set at whatever levels you want. And if you need to use the e-car, you just tap, right? Mm. So you don't have to hold anything. You could hold a toy and then like kick it if you need to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Huh. Um, so some sort of feature like that for something like this would be pretty cool. Yeah. You know, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, I could use it on my phone. I could set my perimeters and do all that and change my levels and stuff and then mm -hmm. have some sort of just device that I could just tap if I need to. Yeah. You know, some Bluetooth kind of thing. Yeah. And I do wish, like you were <laughs> saying, I wish that it could just have like a, a radius thing to your, your phone mm -hmm. where like... It, you know. And it may, again, yeah. as far as that's concerned, it may. I don't know exactly how it functions, but all the things I see, like, on this, if you look at the box, right, it's got, doo -doo -doo, yeah, fence on, right? So, and you could create, so it's, you see it says, yeah. like, perimeter from, yeah. like, a GPS location. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, we'll see. I don't yeah. know. Whatever. Looks like it's cool. Excited to try it. We'll give you guys our full review once you have a chance to check it out. There it is. I'm okay, excited. so I want to talk for a minute about kind of getting started in dog training, right? Because I've been getting a lot of messages and emails lately from people uh, looking to do exactly that, right? They're interested okay. in dog training, right? Yeah. Um, we had a couple people like, uh, you know, whether they did, you know, I think a lot of people get the kickstart when they um they'll do training with their dog somewhere right they'll have a really great experience yeah they see how much that impacts their relationship with their dog mm -hmm. how much better their life is with their dog yeah and they think i want to be able to help people with this you mm -hmm. know what i mean and that's awesome right like i want everybody to be involved in this kind of stuff i want everybody to grow in this industry obviously mm -hmm. um i think a lot of people unfortunately do it the wrong way though Right. Oh, yeah. So, so a lot of people, you know, they'll have a great experience with their dog and they'll have their dog super well trained and then immediately will start trying to help other people with their dogs. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is such a tricky way to get into it. You know what yeah. I mean? Because so much of dog training is not about working with your dogs, but it's working with so many different owners and it's having experienced enough hurdles and enough issues with dogs that you know how to adjust to every scenario you could be presented with. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And everybody has a learning curve, obviously, right? Oh, there, yeah. You're inevitably, you know, when you do start professionally training dogs, going to experience things you haven't experienced before and need mm -hmm. to kind of adjust through it and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. But in the end of the day, um, there are a lot of things you could do to help you get so much more leverage with stuff you know what i mean so that your position to help people better and not ever run into a situation where you become like you know somebody that kind of goes from i trained my dog to i'm a dog trainer to i help people to the best of my knowledge but don't really have much experience as far as how, how to grow past that right mm -hmm. so i want to kind of talk about how i got into dog training and i want to talk about um you know, ways that I typically recommend other people do so, right? Okay. So I've been training dogs for about 10 years now, right? And when I say training dogs for about 10 years now, I mean my entire learning from the standpoint of 
when I started taking my dog through dog training and then working for somebody and then owning my own company, right? Mm-hmm. Has been about a 10 year journey, right? Yep. Um, basically how that worked is the first year I was just a dog owner, right? I was doing the same thing a lot of these people do, which is I hired a dog trainer. I actually hired about three or four different dog trainers and worked with a lot of different people, yeah. right? Wow. All of different styles, right? I think that was an important thing right off the rip is I experienced the old school dog training, right? I experienced the force free dog training. I experienced the balanced dog training and variations of all of those, obviously, mm-hmm. right? And I tried all of the above with my dog, right? Vera, when I got her, right? Yep. I was, I, worked with her every single day. I was constantly trying to learn. I was constantly trying to improve my relationship with her, take that training to the next level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So I did that for about a year and I got fairly good at it. I really enjoy, and when I say I got fairly good at it, I got fairly good at it with my dog, right? And I was really enjoying that process, Mm -hmm. right? From there, I had an opportunity to start working for somebody that I had hired for dog training initially, right? And I worked there for about two years, right? Over the course of the two years, right? um, It was an interesting evolution, right? Because there were some ups to it and there were some big downs to it. Mm -hmm. And all of which were great learning opportunities that I think shaped who I am today, right? Mm. From a dog training standpoint, right? So early on in it, Things were very, I had a lot of guidance, you know what I mean? And guidance came in the form of a lot of different things. It came in the form of like one-on-one training. It came on the form of having access to tons of dogs that I could work with, right? And mm-hmm. access to dogs that I could experiment with. But the biggest way that I had guidance when I started working for somebody was that person got me connected with so many good trainers across the country. Mm-hmm. And connected in the form of actually introducing me to them and connected in the form of just exposing me to their content, the things they were putting out, right? Um, and I absorbed all of that like a sponge, right? Yeah. I was constantly watching videos and this and that. And because I had this mix of the guidance of these are all of these awesome things happening on in the industry. hmm And in addition to that, I had the access to dogs where I could take those things I was learning and kind of experiment with those things with dogs I had access to. Um, I was able to like exponentially grow from a standpoint of like if I would run into issues with something or this or that, I could try things and figure out with each individual case what the right recipe was going to be with stuff. Right. So that was really cool, obviously. Uh, About a year into it, I would say is where things kind of went south from the standpoint of like, we basically had like the business dumped on us. Right. So the guy that owned the company didn't really, he, he, he just kind of like his shtick was he would kind of hire people and be very engaged with them for a while. Mm -hmm. And then basically have them just kind of run things for him. Right. Mm -hmm. So because of that same deal learned a lot, but learned a lot through a lot of mistakes. Right. So same deal had the full control to be able to experiment and see both different ways of training dogs, but Mm -hmm. in addition to that, different ways of running the business and different ways of um, dealing with clients and handling issues and this and that and blah, 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 right? So did that for a while, obviously. Um, Learned quite a bit, right? Built a pretty good clientele, you know, because he wasn't very active with things. Really kind of developed a name for myself because Mm -hmm. I was kind of the face of a lot of the things going on from a training standpoint there. Right. Um, Did that for about two years. At the end of those two years, kind of decided we got to do this on our own. Me Mm -hmm. and another guy that I worked with there decided to start our first dog training company. Right. Mm -hmm. So Heights Canine when I started it. Um, Did that for I think that was 2015, maybe something like that. Did that for like, I think, three and a half years. Right. Mm -hmm. Over the course of those three and a half years. Same deal. At this point, we had so much experience with dealing with all sorts of different scenarios, right? From the standpoint of serious scenarios, dog bites, and 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 dealing with uh, you know client issues and stuff like that, and, mm-hmm. and having the the ability to kind of figure all that kind of stuff out with proper guidance, uh, we were kind of ready to start our own thing from there, right? Did that. Had a staff that worked for us. We built our daycare department. We built our boarding department. We built our training department, stuff like that. 
and you know, kind of continued with that until I decided to leave and start my own company, which was Miracle Canine, right? Mm-hmm. And then we've been doing that ever since. It's been like four and a half years now, right? Wow. Time so, flies. so it's been a big journey, yep. and I think that the important takeaway from it that I try to put on other dog trainers, right, that are getting started in the industry, is though my quote unquote working for somebody was a kind of a wild ride and a strange experience from the standpoint of like we did get the guidance and I did get you know introduced to new things and stuff like that, um, but. I was given a lot of freedom to be able to kind of make mistakes and grow and stuff yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that a lot of people are skipping that step. You know what I mean? Skipping mm-hmm. that step of being able to work with somebody that has had the experience and made a lot of the mistakes mm-hmm. that could really cut some of that learning curve off of things for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think that's that's a big part I want to push on people is if you want to get started in this industry, right, I think one of the best things that you could do is figure out some way where before you start charging and taking money from people to train their dogs, mm-hmm. where you have had so much experience in working with animals and working with training owners a lot, right? <clears throat> and preferably, again, with somebody that can coach you through some of the mistakes you're making to help you avoid some of the big issues that we experienced along the way, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of it. Um, Okay. We're back for a second. We had to pause for three seconds because I was talking, and then I had, like, the biggest brain fart. (laughs) Dude, I was talking, and I just, like, felt my brain. It was, like, right here, right? And Mm -hmm. it's spinning. Mm Mm-hmm. And then it just started doing this, right? You know, where it's spinning and it just starts flying Floating away a little bit. You know what I mean? I was like, I know what I'm trying to say, but for some reason, my brain is getting disconnected from the things I'm trying to say. A little bit of brain fog. Dude, this it's morning. this weather. Whatever. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> we're back. So yeah. that was my, that was basically the Cliff Notes version of how I got it started. Got yeah. started in dog training, right? Yeah, for sure. I get asked that all the time. I've got a couple detailed posts that I've made. I think I have a blog post on it on like my actual blog. If you search like David Turpak blog or something like that, I think I got a blog post where I detailed it out quite a bit. But in a nutshell, again, the evolution was train my own dog, right? Work with other people, right? Work for somebody, right? Learn and develop my style, then start my business. Right. So basically what I'm trying to do here with today's episode is I want to break down for you guys the steps I think that people should take leading up to saying I am a full on dog trainer. Right. Or I should say, right, the steps they should take in leading up to I own my own dog training business. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And these are in somewhat order but they could be kind of flip-flopped around a little bit, right? So let's break some of these things down. I wrote a couple of them out here right now, right? All right. So let's say you want to be a dog trainer. I think step number one, if you're going to be a dog trainer, is you need to perfect training with your own dog, right? Mm -hmm. And, And I wrote here, every issue should have a solution, right? There's nothing that frustrates me more in the dog training industry than when I see dog trainers that are still having massive problems with their dogs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, listen, I'm not here to judge and shame and stuff like that, right? Like, I understand some of this stuff is not easy to get past, Mm -hmm. right? And I'm also not saying that you have to, quote, unquote, fix everything with your dog. Because we talk all the time about realistic expectations as far as how far you're going to get with individual issues that you have with your own personal dogs. For sure. Right? But everything should have a general solution to it, right? Because Mm -hmm. here's the thing. When you're a dog trainer and you're working with clients... Clients are going to expect that there is some sort of solution for the issues that they're having, Mm -hmm. right? A solution could be a really fantastic management plan for things, right? A solution should, could be, um, that you have a training approach that, you know, has gotten you from point A to point B that, maybe took a while, but you still wound up getting there, right? But you should not 
be in a position where it's like, well, I'm not able to socialize my dog, right? I'm not able to give my dog high value resources because they'll guard them. I'm not able to do my dog's nails, right? I'm not able to take them into like really, really busy public settings without them being reactive, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not able to have them off leash in a contained area, or I'm not able to have a good reliable recall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. There should be a solution for every issue that you're experiencing. And there should, you should be in a position where you know there's nothing you can't really do with your dog outside of like realistic things that you could have problems with yeah right right so that's thing number one yeah is, is I, you got to get your personal dog right yeah i mean you don't hire a personal trainer that's out, out of shape right yeah like you gotta you gotta have the the know-how right there yes like, right and again there, there are realistic expectations for all of these types of things like mm-hmm. for example like uh let's use myself and Vinny, right? And uh, and my one trainer, Michelle, and her dog, Lumos. Because we mm-hmm. did a whole podcast, her and I, talking about, like, owning dogs like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, they have, you know, we're not going to just, like, give them to somebody. You know what I mean? It's not like those <laughs> dogs would never, ever bite somebody, yeah. right? Or, or that they would never, ever not get along with another dog or something like yeah, that. Exactly. But both of us are able to socialize our dogs still. We're able to have them around guests. We're able to let them make friends friends with people mm-hmm. and other dogs. We're able to take them anywhere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So um, again, I'm not saying you need to turn your dog into like a perfect golden retriever, mm-hmm. but you should know what your individual dog needs in order to do A, B, C, or D, right? Whether it's exactly. socialize, whether it's go somewhere, whether it's uh, go to the vet, whether it's grooming related mm-hmm. things, those types of things. Know your dog right? in and out. Know your dog in and out um, so that you could better coach people through individual problems, right? Yep. Um, Next thing that I have here, right? So I think a lot of people could benefit a lot from volunteering at a rescue or shelter and have hands-on access to dogs that you could work with, right? Mm. I know, uh, so Bridget, one of my trainers, right, before she came um, to Miracle, right, and started working here, she volunteered at the APL for ever right Mm -hmm. like she was there for a long time additionally past just volunteering at the apl she still to this day will foster dogs through other rescue organizations right and what that does is that gets you around so many different types of dogs that have various levels of issues temperaments stuff like that Mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to interact with them and work with them in a way that is going to be safe and productive for the dog yeah right i think uh i think fostering is really great for this because you get Mm -hmm. to constantly have access to like, I'm bringing a totally green dog into my house Mm -hmm. and I need to figure out how do I live with this dog and manage this dog and work with this dog in a way where it's not going to ruin my life. Right. And as you get around those different types of temperaments, you get to learn what each individual one needs, right? Past your own dog, because whether you, let's say you have three dogs, right? And you work through step number one with all of them and you perfect the training with them and you get everything to a place where everything is really good and you don't have any issues with them and this and that, Mm -hmm. that's still just three different dogs, right? There are so many different types of dogs out there (laughs) of various different temperaments Mm -hmm. that um, you need to be able to experience as many of them as you can, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Preferably in the case of this, I usually say find a shelter or a rescue that also is open to all sorts of different training methods, Mm -hmm. right? Because you could very easily find some shelters out there that are, for example, only force free, right? Mm -hmm. Or only this or only that. And you're, you're not going to have as much freedom of being able to help work through a lot of different types of issues, right? Where there are some rescues that we work with in particular, that they are open to any methods of training and they just want these dogs to be in engaged and stimulated right Mm -hmm. and they will give you a lot more freedom to if you're fostering their dog right or if you're going there and and spending 30 minutes with each dog per day at a shelter or rescue or something like that they'll give you a lot more freedom to be able to work with them as you need to right and that'll be able to broaden your skills and stuff Mm -hmm. right next thing is work around dog trainers right so what does that look like? Well, 
you know, uh, at Miracle, we have positions that are not dog training positions, right? Mm -hmm. We have administrative positions. We have media positions. We have kennel tech positions. We have all sorts of different positions <clears throat> where you're working around the trainers, but you may not be actually training dogs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those positions are easier to get into than a dog training position. Yeah. And you get the added benefit of being able to be around training all the time and be able to experience it and see it. You get access typically to be able to, to interact with those people and hang out with yep. them and ask questions and learn from them right yep. and to continue broadening your knowledge obviously so if you have the ability to do so i think that quote unquote going in and kind of paying your dues in a position like that to be able to have the access to learning about the things that you want to learn about can be highly beneficial yep. one perk we have at our facility is we if for all of our kennel techs and stuff if they have dogs we train them for them you know what i mean like yeah. all of our kennel techs we comp free sessions for them to be able to help them learn a lot about training. And it's a yep. really cool shift that we see where they'll start as a kennel tech, right? And they'll be around the training and they like it and it's cool and all that, right? But mm -hmm. like, they're still disconnected from it. You know what I mean? They're like, I'm a kennel yeah. tech, you're a trainer kind of thing. And then as they go through the training classes, we see their entire state of mind change, right? Because they start to understand it more. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, I get this. I understand why you're doing the things you do. Mm -hmm. And we'll completely notice this like 180 in the way that they handle the dogs that are in our care to begin with. You yeah. know what I mean? There's so much more of an attention to detail mm -hmm. and so much more of like, okay, I'm doing this, but I'm understanding why I'm doing this. And they know how to make adjustments then from there and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's one big perk <clears throat> that we add in to help them further understand what it is that we do. Now, does every training company do that? No. Right. Do I think every training company needs to do that? No. Right. That's it's, it's your choice, how you want to run your business, obviously. Yeah. But that's one added benefit that you can find. I'm sure there's other places around the country that offer that as well. Right. Yeah. You're, you're you become a product of your environment. Yep. You know, you know, and then again, getting back to volunteering at this point, I wouldn't do this, but I am sure that there are plenty of dog trainers out there that need a little bit of help cleaning and stuff like that. That you, if you offer your time to go and volunteer at their kennel and walk some dogs and clean some kennels and stuff like that, that they'd be happy to sit down and share some knowledge with you as well. Yeah. Right. So working around other dog trainers can be another very, very productive thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> Um, next one, and this is a big one that I think a lot of people miss as well, right, is learn about every single style of dog training, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the ones that you want to do. Yep. Right? We talked about this numerous times, right? I think that in as polarizing of an industry as dog training is, if you stick too much in your lane as far as your knowledge, you will not be able to relate or empathize with the other side very much, right? True. So, so this the when we were seeing the TikTok drama or when people from like force free camps and stuff like that like to hop on and like give a shit and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I think to an inexperienced dog trainer, right, that doesn't know that much about the individual styles, mm -hmm. um, you could get two in your head of not being able to even see what they're saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's, that's non-productive because if you're going to argue a point, right? If I am going to say, you know what, Josh, the way that I do this is right because of this. And you're going to say, you know what, David, the way you're doing this is wrong because of this. I need to know why you're doing the things that you're doing. And I need to know all of your points to be able to see one, are any of them valid, yeah. right? And if they are valid, you could adopt some of those things to improve on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if they're not valid, you need to be able to articulate why they are not valid in a clear, concise way. Yep. Right? Um, and that stops things from hitting this, like, emotional point. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you look at, a, like, a lot of the way that people will argue, like we see this a lot with the force free trainers where they'll come on and they'll be like, everything you're doing is wrong and you're an animal abuser and this is horrible and this and that, yeah. but it's all emotion. You know what I mean? hundred percent. There's no, there's no articulation of this is why what you're doing is so bad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where I really like to try to say, you know, if I am getting attacked in a situation like that, this is this is the counterpoint to the points you guys are making. There's no emotion behind it. It's not that I'm mad at you or anything mm. like that. It's simply this is why your argument is invalid. Yeah. Right? Past just that, right, there are stuff from both sides that can be learned. 
Mm -hmm. right? You get into, again, if you want to be a good balanced trainer, right? And you want to be able to use food and use rewards and use motivation and stuff like that. The people that are doing only that in a lot of cases are going to do that part of training better than the people that don't do that all the time. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So people that invented clicker training, you get into, again, Karen Pryor, and you get into these other, you know, Susan Garrett's another big name in, in clicker training and stuff like that. And some of these other force free trainers, there's a lot to be learned from the standpoint of why they're implementing things in the way that they implement them. And if you could take the best of that world and apply mm -hmm. it to the best of this world, you're going to be a more well-rounded trainer <clears throat> because of it. Yep. Right. So that's a massive part of it. And then past just that, looking at the opposite side of things, right? A lot of balanced trainers give the old school training a lot of flack. You know what I mean? Like the old yank and crank style training, which mm -hmm. again, I get it. You know, it's not like we're out here training dogs that way anymore and stuff. Yeah. You get into like the Keeler school of dog training, which is like the OG yank and crank like dog trainers, mm -hmm. right? Um, same deal though, right? They have a much better concept of utilizing compulsion to train dogs, right? Yeah. And that's a negative connotation, right? In the dog world is <laughs> using compulsion. You're a compulsion based trainer and this and yeah. that, but it's like, there's a degree of compulsion used in dog training. And if you could understand the people that use only that and why they used only that for so long, mm -hmm. um, again, and you could take some of that knowledge and apply it to your training, you're going to be a more well-rounded, more balanced trainer because of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's another massive one that I I think a lot of people should do and continue to do, right? So every time you see new trends pop up in dog training, this and that, you should be able to look at that, understand why it was being done and understand why you like it or why you don't like it. And this stuff comes in handy because I was actually talking about this yesterday. So I did a lesson yesterday and um, the client was asking me, you know, do we ever hit it? Do we, do you teach the, the go say hi, right? And it's, it's so funny because she said it, and I kind of chuckled for a minute because I haven't heard it thrown a <laughs> around in a while, okay. right? But there was like a trend in dog training maybe like four years ago, five years ago, something like that, maybe even longer, like six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. that like people were like training go say hi, right, as a way to like, I don't know, like get dogs <laughs> more comfortable with yeah. people or something like that. And basically <laughs> the concept of it is you were teaching a trick of like somebody would sit in a chair yeah. who was supposed to be the trigger, right? And they would like have their hands out like this typically. Yeah. And the trainer would come up with the dog on a leash and they would say, go say hi. And go say hi was the cue for the dog to go and like boop the hand of the person, right? So oh, like okay. it was like teaching a touch command, right? Yeah. Like you were teaching a touch command on like a person, right? Interesting. And the dog was doing that, and then they would come back to the, the trainer for a treat, right? Oh. And, you know, <laughs> again, like, in theory, I get why people were doing it. They're like, oh, we're teaching the dog to like going up to new people, yeah. right? Now, that was just a trend. That went away. Mm -hmm. People aren't really teaching that anymore because they realize it's problematic and not actually creating <clears throat> any sort of more confidence in new people. Yeah. Because the... the <laughs> It's very similar to the whole like having strangers give your dog treats when they're scared yeah. of them. It puts the dog in a vulnerable, it creates false expectations and puts the dog in a really vulnerable position, mm -hmm. right? So let's look at the treat thing, right? Everybody says if your dog is scared of new people, have the new people give them treats, mm -hmm. right? And let's say the dog really likes treats and they go over to the person, they're like, I really like treats. I'm going to go over to you and get these treats. Well, as soon as the treats go away, then the dog is now immediately had been kind of lured into this really uncomfortable position. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the person is usually petting and interacting and stuff. And then the yeah. treats are gone and they're like, holy shit, I'm still really scared of this person. But I accidentally put myself in this position mm -hmm. where I'm more, I'm basically more over threshold next to them. And now the treats yeah. aren't there and I'm just going to bite the person. Yeah. You know what I mean? So whatever. It was a flawed mentality in the way they were teaching it. Yeah. But I was aware of that. I learned about that concept of teaching the go say hi. So because of that, as soon as the client was asking me about it the other day, I was able to articulate clearly why that's not a thing people really do anymore and why that was a flawed thing at the time when they were teaching it, mm -hmm. right? And the more educated you are on those types of things, the better you're going to be able to answer your client's questions and the more current you're going to stay of things going on in the dog training world, Yeah, right? So that's another one, obviously. So next thing, I talk about this a lot, find some friends that have dogs that you could train for free or <clears throat> for a case of beer. There you go. 
<laughs> or whatever, they right? Won't be Buy trick. me lunch and I'll fucking try to train your dog. Yeah. You know I, mean? <laughs> I think if you're not working under some listen, if you're if you get a training a junior training position at a training company or something like that, and you're yep. working under a dog trainer and you're a dog trainer, but you don't have that much experience, yeah, mm-hmm. obviously you're you're getting paid for it and stuff like that. And that's all fine and dandy and great. But in most cases, that's gonna be a hard position to to nab up, right? Mm-hmm. Um I think getting the experience of I'm actually training a dog for a person right now is an important skill that people should learn how to do before they're charging for it, right? Having a friend where you could do, all right, I'm going to do five sessions with you free of charge, right? You get Mm -hmm. the experience of working with dogs. You get the experience of working with dogs in front of owners. You get the experience of training owners how to do things. And it's Mm -hmm. less pressure because it's somebody typically you have a relationship with at that point. Yep. Right? So I think that's an important thing to do. And the first time you go to actually do that, you're going to notice issues with it. I, I, I'll tell you, I, you know, what's funny is I remember the first time that I did that, I was kind of working as a kennel tech. I wasn't really like a dog trainer at the time. Yeah. And I had a friend that had a dog and I was going to train her dog for free, right? Mm-hmm. And in my mind, I was like, I did all this training with my dogs. They're yeah. great. I'm hands-on with these other dogs. It's yeah. fine, dandy, this, that, right? Uh-huh. I did like three sessions with this girl. And this was like right when I started working at this dog training facility, right? Yeah. I did like three lessons with this girl and they were a goddamn disaster, dude. They were <laughs> nothing went the way that I wanted it to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was such a wake up call for me because like in my mind, I was pff, I'm Joe Schmo dog trainer right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know everything. And I went to do these <laughs> lessons and nothing worked out the way I did or the way that I wanted it to. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And that was a huge learning opportunity for me because I had to adjust. I had to figure out what was going wrong and I had to make those adjustments to get it to work. Yeah. Right. So being able to do that is going to expose issues. It's going to expose confidence issues from you, whatever. It's going to, it's going to just, it's going to really bring you to ground level of learning the actual skill because we know training the dog is such a small part of things. You know what I mean? But training the owner and working through the day to day issues that come with that is everything with it. Oh, yeah. (sighs) Next one if you have the opportunity to work up the ladder at a training kennel, right? Mm -hmm. So we, for the majority of our trainers that we've had have all been people that we've hired internally, right? So they start as a kennel tech, right? They work their way up from a kennel tech to a uh, socialization specialist or something. And then Mm -hmm. maybe they, they, they move to like a junior trainer position and they move to an actual trainer position. Right. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we're going to be able to mold them and we're going to be able to teach them the craft in a precise way. They're going to avoid a lot of issues because they're going to have supervision and guidance and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And that could be a great way to do it, but again, can be difficult to do. Right. In a lot of cases, you're going to have to develop yourself as a trainer. Then you're going to have to go pitch yourself to a training company to see if they want to hire you for it. Mm -hmm. Right. But I'll tell you a lot of training companies, do like to hire people green if you're motivated if you got a good personality for it Mm -hmm. um, and if you've done a great job with working with your personal dogs and stuff like that and you don't have too much of an ego on you um, people love that right I love that right I would rather take Mm -hmm. somebody from green and teach them all of the things I want to teach them than hire somebody that has had six years, seven years of experience. Because yeah. in a lot of cases, it can work out sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, it worked out with Mich- Michelle. is obviously a phenomenal example of somebody who had a lot of training experience <laughs> before coming here. Yeah. Right? But in the past when I've done it, it's also run into a lot of issues because you have a lot of <clears throat> bad ha- Maybe not even bad habits. You have a lot of habits that person has as a trainer that mm-hmm. you need to then combat and mm-hmm. almost like butt heads with them about yeah. until they finally understand why what you're kind of coaching them to do is more beneficial, at least in the context of what you're trying to do with your organization. Yep. Right? So that's another thing. <clears throat> Here's another one that I think a lot of people miss out on that I've always done this, even since I since before dog training, that I think has helped me a lot. Right? Okay. <clears throat> Um, educate yourself on people skills outside of the dog training uh, industry. <laughs> Influence and confidence is everything, mm-hmm. right? Work on yourself, work on your public speaking, mm-hmm. work on your confidence in communicating and influencing people. Yep. And if you do those things, you will be a better dog trainer. Oh, we yeah. are in the people service industry, not the dog service industry, <laughs> right? And the Definitely. biggest breakthroughs and biggest successes that I've had have been the successes and breakthroughs where I get people to make those breakthroughs, not dogs. Yep. Right? 
So that could be anything from reading books, taking public speaking classes. Um, it could be literally anything that gets you out and about and communicating with people in uncomfortable ways, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of conversations you're going to have to have with people are conversations that are not comfortable conversations. It's yep. me getting you to realize what, what you're doing is wrong and why it's so important that you make those adjustments and why it's wrong in the first place. And in a lot of cases, depending on what kind of clientele you're dealing with, a lot of times you're dealing with people that have big egos. Mm -hmm. We work with a lot of, quote unquote, very successful people. You know what I mean? Business owners, finance guys, this, that, or people that... Psh, they make gazillions of dollars and they think they know everything about all sorts of different things. Yeah. And in some cases that could transfer to, they think they already know everything about the dog. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and getting them to understand your side of things is a very, very important skill that you need to develop. Mm -hmm. Yes. I agree with that. That one I'm sure even applies to you, <laughs> yeah. right? Like that one applies to every industry. Every and that's something that really, everybody should just look at overall Yeah, is the personal development side of like communicating and influencing people. One of the best books I ever read in my life, and it's, it's a super popular book. I'm sure most people have heard of it. Obviously it's called, I think it was by Dale Carnegie, um, how to win friends and influence people. Mm -hmm. Right. Phenomenal book. If you haven't read it, you should go fucking buy it. And read it. It's an easy read too. It's like a short book. Okay. Um, how to win friends, fr friends, how to win Flins. friends. <laughs> how to win friends and influence people <clears throat> is basically just a book on how to communicate with people in a way that motivates them to do what you want them to do. Right. Uh, and it sounds like it's like scum. It's not, it's not, it's not that, not, right. Yeah. It's not like this, like scummy, like car salesman thing. It's simply like, so they go through a lot of examples. Like it's written like a college course. Like it's a, mm -hmm. it's a dense book. Right. Okay. Um, but he has all these examples of like how people have handled really tough situations with people and two different ways it can go about being handled okay. and why the other is the better. Like one of the examples was like, you know, I think, I think like a guy was, was filing a complaint with a business or something like that for a massive issue that they did. And the okay. first email was like him mad and berating them and this and that, and mm -hmm. like basically putting the person into the defense. And the other was this like message that was perfectly articulated in a way where it complimented them on the, what they're used to getting and articulated what the issue was and mm -hmm. clearly stated what the proper solution they thought was going to be for it and said it in mm -hmm. a way where it made the other person feel good and mm -hmm. made it feel like, okay, we are happy to make the adjustments that you're asking us to make, yeah. right? Others where there were examples of how um, <clears throat> CEOs and business managers and stuff like that handled issues with uh, employees and stuff in a way that same deal didn't bash people down, but helped them feel more motivated to make the correct choices later on, mm -hmm. right? So things like that are so essential for growing every industry. Oh, yeah. What Can you think of any times that you've dealt with, I mean... Like, like tough situations you've dealt with as far as people like expecting too much or um, um, whatever. W ways that like those types of skills have helped you in the past. Oh, yeah. I mean, a, a recent client of mine, I would say um, <clears throat> we're kind of yanking my chain around and rescheduling consistently. Um and I had to just kind of put my foot down, but we're going to have rescheduling fees. Mm -hmm. Like, you're wasting my time. Mm -hmm. You're wasting the people that I'm hiring's time. Yep. And I had to add that to the, you know, to the bill. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I, I did it in a way that didn't make them pissed off about yeah. it. And they they understood. And they, they understood that what was happening was kind of their fault. Mm -hmm. And then they were um, happily obliging to pay those rescheduling fees. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think that, you know, we're all human and inevitably everybody handles situations in ways that they don't want to handle them. Right. Yeah. But as long as you're consciously aware of things, mm -hmm. like it, it baffles me sometimes that there's still people out there that will like, like resort to like yelling and berating <laughs> and screaming and yeah. like making people feel like just complete pieces of shit over issues. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like when mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing you're going to get. All it does is put somebody on the defense. Yep. You know what I mean? I just, I just, I can't, 
I can't fathom that. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, it truly shows how little you actually care about people. Yeah. Blows my mind. I mean, here, you're never going to get what you want that way. Never. Never works. Never. Right? And if, if you do temporarily get what you want, it's out of pure resentment. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, and know. you burned that bridge. It, it, it baffles me, right? Yep. So work on those skills, right? Those are essential skills that can help you out in this field, obviously. Yep. Right? And then the last one is just keep learning and keep growing, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about this last time, I think, or, or two episodes ago, I think we talked about. We made a couple clips out of it that did pretty well, where it was like <clears throat> constantly be aware of your, like, shortcomings. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like as you're growing in this industry and as you're developing yourself and stuff like that, as long as you constantly have attention on how to improve and mm-hmm. you never stay too stagnant, like you're going to be good. Yep. You know, hundred percent. So those are kind of my general tips on getting started in the industry. Like I said, this is just like randomly thrown together and stuff like that. But if you could take those tips and you could apply them to the things that you're doing and apply them to your growth in this industry. And you could move a little slower. I think a lot of people move too fast with it. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? They move from, again, I work with my dog and things are good to like, I'm just, I'm just a dog trainer. Yeah. Right. And can you grow and evolve and stuff like that in the industry doing it that way? Sure can. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, you can get a couple lucky breaks and get surrounded with the right people and stuff like that and be all right. But man, if you put in place the groundwork and the framework for stuff before you really jump in, head first with stuff, you're just going to be so much more successful with so things. So much. So much more successful with things. And so much faster. <laughs> and so much faster. You know what I mean? It's like in dog training itself, we talk about, you know, dogs that know their commands and know their basics and all that kind of stuff. And then, mm-hmm. But then when push comes to shove and you run into difficult times, if the foundation of all those commands and all those skills isn't good enough, things can kind of fall apart really quickly, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Where if you have a dog that you spent so much time on the basics and the foundations of your commands are really good and your communication <coughs> systems are really good and this and that, when you run into those tough situations, then at that point, those foundations will keep things secure and you'll be able to work through issues issues better, right? Again, further equating this to dog training, we see all the time that dogs come in and everybody's like, well, my dog knows sit down, stay, bed, calm, this, that, right? Mm -hmm. But they choose not to do it in distracting situations. We had a comment on, we made a video the other day. Let me pull it up real quick. Mm -hmm. Made a video the other day, what to do when guests come over. We talked about here. Step number one, make sure your dog understands clearly that a doorbell ringing or a knock at the front door is going to predict you putting them onto their bed. By making sure that this is something that you predictably do every single time somebody comes over the house, it helps your dog understand that pattern and that routine and be successful with it long term. Step number two, make sure that your dog holds that bed stay for roughly 15 minutes once the person comes into the house. Most people make the mistake of only doing it for one to two minutes, and by the time their dog is released, from position the arousal level is still at a level 11 and we want it to be at a level five having it be for a longer period of time helps the dog relax and gives the dog an opportunity to get acclimated to the new person being in the house and understand that they are not a threat step number three once you go to release your dog from position have no expectation of them aside from not jumping on your guests what this does is it puts the dog in a position where they can move around freely through the house and if as they're interacting with one of your guests they get uncomfortable they could walk away as opposed to putting them in a sit and having people approach them where they're in a position where they're trapped and are going to act more defensively. So whatever. So uh, somebody commented on it, something along the lines of like, man, I'm trying so hard to do this, but my dogs just freak out and go bananas when people come to the house. Right. Mm -hmm. And I said in it, I was like, well, yeah, I was like, our foundations of our train, like the dog needs to be trained before we implement something like yeah. this, right? This is an sure. example of like, you could have a dog that generally knows, go to your bed, right? And they walk over to the bed and you may have just like intuitively taught it by shaping it throughout your day around like low distractions and stuff like that, yeah. right? And you may think the dog has a really concrete, solid understanding of that command. But when push comes to shove in a situation like this, because your foundations of how you give the command, how you enforce the command, how you reward for the command, command 
are not really clear Mm -hmm. in that high pressure situation like that, your dogs are going to go bananas and freak out and you're going to have no way of being able to get them to be successful with it. Right. Which is why when people call me and they say, my dog knows all their commands, can't we do a shorter program? Right. Can't we do five sessions instead (laughs) of 10 command sessions, this, that I always tell them yes. Under some circumstances, if the dog has been professionally trained elsewhere, we can obviously if the foundations are good, but in most cases, every dog we work with has a general understanding of these commands, but we need to go back in and we need to make sure the foundations of all of them are good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's why it's important is because in situations like that, if the foundations are not good, you can't do anything. (laughs) Means nothing. So again, in your business, right, in your dog training company, stuff like that, if your foundations within being a dog trainer are not really concrete, you will Mm -hmm. crumble when you run into difficult situations. Yes. Right? Um, Again, we've talked about it all the time. We've run into so many different hurdles. Different hurdles that when I first started getting involved in this, I would have never guessed in a million years I would have had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Right? And we deal with them, right? And because the foundations are good in what we do, we are able to handle them well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. So that's a lot of it. Those are my those are my short tips on how you can get started in this industry, and my short tips of the um, the foundational steps you need to have established if you want to get through in this industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the perfect perfect example of a person that did every single one of those correctly would be our friend down in Revolutionary. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he talked about it too. You know, I, yeah. we, we got to, I was texting with him recently. We got to get him back on and like do a more in depth one, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, he kind of talked about how he got started in the industry and how mm-hmm. he paid his dues and how as soon as he, st- you know, he had the advantage of he had owned a prior business, right? So he knew a little bit about the business development and stuff like that, yeah. which helped him. He had foundational steps there. He had his dogs really, really good, right? He worked for basically free training other people's yeah. dogs for a little bit. For a case of beer, got, I think, right? No, it's for a bag of dog food. Oh, a bag food. of dog yeah, food, 50, yeah. I think it was fifty dollars in a bag of dog <laughs> yeah. food or something like that, right? So, so he put in the steps with that, right? He um, wor- worked around dog trainers from the standpoint of like he was going all over the place doing consults with people and stuff like that. That's how I met him, mm-hmm. right? To continue to try to learn, um, you know, when he, re- he he surrounded himself with mentors where when he ran into issues with his business that he didn't know how to handle them, he could reach out and ask for guidance on those types of things. Yep. You know what I mean? Like you just, you want to make sure you take the steps right and you grow at a nice, reasonable pace with things. Exactly. So, all right. Well, listen, um, like I said, we'll, we'll play more with this halo collar. We'll talk about it a little bit more next time. Um, impromptu, um, little, little being a dog trainer kind of segment on things. Mm -hmm. And then next week we have a guest coming on a pretty sweet guest. I don't even like, here's the thing. Like I want to say who it is, (laughs) but I'm so gun shy on like, (laughs) you know, like what if they back out or or that? So like, I'm just not going to do it right now. (laughs) Yeah. It's a good idea. I'm just not going to do it, but (laughs) it's a, it's a sweet guest. This guest has about, I think like 50,000 followers on uh, Instagram and stuff like that. Post some really killer content. It's going to make, uh, some phenomenal, um, phenomenal conversation, hopefully. So yeah, I'm excited for it. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll catch you guys next time. Grow yourself. Yeah. Grow your business. There you grow go. Grow your dog training.